Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Uh, today we are going to be talking about the aesthetic vacuum of our age in the Romantic Manifesto series. So let me hand it over to Sherry. Hi there. So we thought we would start this, um, this time with a little bit, it's a very short chapter, um, and she talks um, a great deal about um, literature, but um, I wanted to start with this very last paragraph of this chapter that we're reading, where she says, and I quote, just as man's aesthetic preferences are the sum of his metaphysical values and the barometer of his soul, so art is the sum and the barometer of a culture. Modern art is the most eloquent demonstration of the cultural bankruptcy of our age. So I thought it would be really good if we could get some visuals wrapped around this. Last time I showed a little bit of what was happening in painting that took us from uh, classicism into um, romanticism. We didn't talk about naturalism uh, very much. We just sort of touched on it. So I'm gonna show a couple quick examples of naturalism and then um, a series of paintings uh, that shows you a little bit of an example of the sorts of things that Ayn Rand is talking about at this point. She's in this chapter referring to literature, but she's talked in other chapters throughout this book about um, the same thing happening in the other arts. So we're gonna share screen here and we'll start with the image we started with that we uh, showed you before. This is the Gustav, um, wait, we'll wait a second, here it is. As a, actually, you know, right. full size. I want to hit play on this. There we go. Play. All yeah. right. So now everybody can see that. Okay. So this is a Gustav Courbet self portrait, 1843. Um, and we talked briefly last time about how this um, romanticism in visual arts was really, it's, it's defined by non-essentials. So it's really about emotion um, more than a specific type of emotion. Um, so I wanted to start with this one and show you that as this one's from 1843, as we get not very many years beyond, uh, the same painter has transitioned to this. Oops. Yep, can you, there we go. So this is called the washerwomen. And so now what instead of, uh, this is where Ayn Rand's talking in literature, um, where you go from showing a hero to showing the everyday. Um, and this is the sort of thing that was happening at the very same time in the visual arts, especially in painting. You can also see the coloration, um, the drama of the light is less so. Um, and then I have one more from the same painter, Gustave Courbet. Um, this one is called The Stonebreakers, um, 1849. So again, you've got that radical change from his self-portrait to this stage. There, he does have self-portraits at this point of his career, which are much more like this. It's like he's really calmed down a lot. And the things that you notice here, if you look carefully, notice how the man on the left, how tattered and torn his shirt is right above his pants. Even his pants at the bottom of the hem is torn. The man on the right, um, just under his arm, his vest is torn. Um, they're dusty, they're sweaty. Um, you know, I, I, I work in architecture, so I see heroes in stonemasons, but this is not showing the hero of the stonemason. This is showing the toil of the stonemason. Um, so once you get through this level of naturalism, then there's a few interesting things that start happening. Um, and I'm going to show you a series of paintings, and I'm not going to tell you who, uh, who this is by, because uh, these are all the, all these next photos are the same painter. This here is Windmill um, in Sunlight, and it's this is 1908. So you can see here, First of all, it's a windmill. So you're probably guessing he's Dutch and you'd be right. <laughs> <laughs> but you notice here, this is really intense use of color. It's really painted in red, 
blue and yellow. And here's another one of those examples when uh, some understanding of science, which happened about 50 years or so prior to this, but this is about the time that it starts feeding into the art world, this understanding of three primary colors of which all other colors can be mixed from. Um, and so you start seeing this really intense um, coloration from painters. And so this, and this was considered in that uh, romanticism point because of its intense use of color. But other than that, it's really much in a different, it's in a different category, more um, abstract and impressionist. Um, so let's go to the next one. And here is another painting, same painter. This one's called Red Tree. And this is also 1908, so same year. And if you squint up to your screen, you can see the bark on the tree is actually in a really dark, dark vermilion red. And it's got these dark lines and this bright, bright color. And the interesting thing is the same painter four years down the road has transitioned into this. So you can see now, and we're not showing humans here, but we are showing the way the artist is seeing the world. So this one is called Gray Tree. Uh, so it's a four years later, and you can see there's still these dark black lines, but now the tree is really dissolving into this geometric shapes. And then the next one is the same year. This one is called tree. Um, and I don't know how many of us would actually have we not seen the previous one and had not known of the title of this. We might see tree because if we see sort of a trunk and sort of a branching and we might think tree because we sort of see leaf shapes, but it's a really high abstraction of what a tree is. Um, the next one, same artist. Now we're another, another year down the road. So this is 1913. And notice the last one was called tree. There's still some reference to something out in the world. Now it's called tableau number two, composition number seven. So while there's clearly, at, if you see all of this painter's paintings in a row, you'll see that there's a progression in this painter's mind of what's happening and what they're finding is important. Remember, Joya talked about this in the very first lecture that what's, it's, what, it's, it's all about what the artist sees as important. And so now we have come to a very far different land than where we started from when we had that red tree. Um, let's go to the next one. We go another five years down the road. And now you might have an idea who we're talking about here. This one is composition with gray and light brown. This is eight, 1918. Um, and now I don't know if we're talking trees anymore. I really couldn't. It's, it's not about the trees. It's not about what's out in the world. It's now about the contrast of these individual blocks of colors and the size of each block of color and how one color is, how it's reacting to the color next to it. Um, the next one, this one is composition with color planes and gray lines. Number one. And so here notice back for that very first painting of the windmill, we have reds and blues and yellows. That's what we've come to. Um, and it's just about, um, it's about those blocks of color and how much color you have in each individual spot, how they're associated and the shapes, how that reacts from one to the next. The next one we have, oh, I'm sorry, I bumped you. You probably did that. Did I, 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 I'm sorry, hang on a second here. We messed things up. Yeah, how did you do that? I don't know what I did. Hold on, I, I have no. Okay, oh. here we are. This is composition A. And by this point, you've probably all realized we're talking about Piet Mondrian. 
And this is 1921. So it's another three years down the road. And so now he's no longer in gray, it's black. Well, although these lines are gray, but the colors are black and white and red, blue and yellow. So it's now all about those primary colors, their reaction from one to the next. And then I think we have one more. So this is by 1930, another nine years down the road. Um, and it is brought down to its simplest essentials by that point. Now, you can see here, the, you, we can probably stop sharing yeah. around. You can see here, we're really changed what the focus, what the painters are thinking as important. Um, but what's interesting to me, maybe Srikant can stop us sharing. We're stopped here at Mondrian for good. <laughs> here we go, there we go. Um, so what we can see here is that it's, it's not about the world, it's not about the people, it's now about this distilled details of um, the contrast between colors and lines and shapes. And this always reminds me of um, reading, and this is going to seem really strange at first, but follow me. Um, it reminds me of reading Dr. Seuss. Because when you read Dr. Seuss, um, he's taking each of these little stories and he's focusing on the same sound. It's not about the story any longer. It's about the same sound over and over used with different, and then you probably could come up with one really quick. Sox and Fox on Socks blocks and... with Knox and yeah. That kind yeah, of so it's all about that sound. It's not, and, 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 and Dr. Well, the... and, and then it's not about making any sense. <laughs> no, it's not about making sense. It's about those distilled elements of it. Now, when I was in architecture school, we had um, a we had our studio class, which was our huge major portion. We also had a class called visual training. And I went to um, IIT in Chicago, Illinois Institute of Technology. It's an engineering school, and it was It was started. The curriculum in the architecture program was started by Mies van der Rohe who was of the international style. So we were very much steeped in modern art. And our, we had classes every Tuesdays and Thursdays for like three hours each day, um, it, titled visual training. And what we were doing was we were taking things like, we had, for, and we would do this for weeks at a time, we would take things like inspiration from Piet Mondrian's last compositions with these the square and all these little divisions in it, we would have to build essentially a cube out of little sticks for a one by one by one cube with individual walls um, dividing it out. And we would have to spend you know weeks um, taking individual pieces of paper, whether they were translucent or opaque, whether they were textured or they were smooth or they were shiny, what kind of light reflectance would happen off of them. And our job was to tinker with the aesthetic reaction of these distilled parts. Um, in that sense, it was highly excellent training, but we were never talking about creating art. We were doing assignments, we were doing plates. So, but that's really what these artists were doing at the same time. Skills. Oh, it's like doing, um, if you were ever a musician, practicing your scales and your arpeggios. It would be that sort of, it was training to help you focus on one distinct element. Um, so this is really sort of the background of what Ayn Rand is talking about um, in the visual arts. Um, architecture was a little something different, but I thought this would be a great way for us to kind of have that visual reference of what's happening when we start talking about the um, literature. Next up is Maritza. That was fantastic. I, so I, I have said before, I'm not a huge, you know, art, artwork aficionado. I don't know a lot about artists, but I have to say, I didn't realize that that earlier work was the same because mm -hmm. um, I'm familiar with um, the later works. I didn't realize the earlier tree work art was the same um, yeah. artist. That's 
fascinating and tragic to me. I have this uh, weird like fascination with trees and tree artwork and I, I'm kind of horrified to realize that you went from painting trees to painting squares. Oh. <laughs> um, but I think that's a fantastic way to pictorially describe this chapter. I, this is a very short chapter, but I honestly believe that this chapter here is Ayn Rand's entire premise of why she believes we need a romantic movement in art and, and her belief why art is so necessary to our very consciousness. And so, you know, the aesthetic vacuum of age, like, oh, what the heck does that mean? Basically what she's telling us is that she believes art as it exists today, and by today we mean the time in which she was living and writing these, um, well, I don't wanna say books, but you know, these little articles that were then compiled in this book. She's saying that she is seeing art bereft of anything that would be useful from her perspective of values to the population in general. And, you know, cause she uses, she talks of naturalists and, and what it really comes down to is she's talking about volition and about choice. And she's saying to us, romanticism as I describe it to you as the better option is allowing for us to view the fact that there is volition in man and existence. The opposite from Ayn Rand's perspective would be naturalism where she's saying naturalism actually denies that. Actualism is deterministic and, and she actually makes a distinction and I don't remember if it was in the book but she does when she speaks on this topic. She makes a distinction between determinism and the Aristotelian point of view, which she, that's what, that's Ayn Rand's perspective. You know, we have, we're not deterministic in nature is what she's saying to us. Um, and so, she, you know, she, what she says of naturalists is that what they're telling us is that you don't, like the artists should not try to invoke anything. They should merely be stenographers as it were. And, and that's kind of the, what, what she's telling to us here in this, this tiny little chapter. There are a couple things here that really stick out to me. You know, when she says one, when she's talking, she's going on and speaking of um, how, you know, you get less and less. So she shows how naturalism is just destroying the concept of the romantic movement. And she's saying that the evil there is that we're taking away the ability for humankind to see what ought to be and what should be in a uplifting and ideal type of light. And I'm gonna switch for a moment to here to one of her other works, one of Ayn Rand's works of art, and this is The Fountainhead. And we, we did speak about this um, when we started off the series. And so for those of you who are not familiar, this, this book is about um, sticking true to your own values and about an architect who had to go through all these trials and tribulations to do so. And you know, it's, it's, it's a very, it's a fantastic novel. In this novel, there is a, I don't wanna say he's a villain, but he is a shining example of the opposite of the protagonist. And what he's exemplifying actually in the book is um, collectivism. And it's done now, you know, there is a bias here. Ayn Rand does have a bias. She's very, very against collectivism. But that being said, so this, for those of you who are familiar with the book, I'm talking of Ellsworth Tui. And Ellsworth Tui is portrayed throughout the book as a very subtle personality wielding influence upon people almost behind the scenes. You, you, it almost sneaks up on you as the reader how absolutely devious he is. It's a very well-written character. He's fascinating as a character if you're looking at it from a literary point of view. And, but, but if you're somebody who upholds the concepts of individualism and such, ultimately you're gonna view him as this vile evil creature. He has 
this, he starts this guild of different types of literary people. And what he's doing is he's collecting mediocre or just flat out terrible artist. And it's not clear to you initially why he's doing it, but he starts to tell us. So there's a scene in the, in the book. And for those of you, again, if you have the book and you're familiar with it, it's in the fourth part of the book. I forget which chapter, I think it's chapter six. There's a scene where Tui is talking to this mishmash group of mediocre artists. And in this room, there is an, there is a critic, a playwright critic, like super well-renowned, kind of like a super stuffy guy who thinks over much of himself. The, the name of the character who called this group together for the purpose of hearing his play, his name is Ike. So this guy read to this group of, uh, it's a handful of people. He read to them his play and they're all like, dude, this is crap, this sucks, it's terrible. And everybody's in agreement that it's like awful. And the weird thing is that Ellsworth Tui and the critic start to say it's wonderful. They say it's so terrible that it's great. And you're, as a reader, you're like, where are they going with this? And where they're going is that they're telling you what they're trying to say is that it's, it's the quality, it pinpoints exactly what Ayn Rand is trying to point out with, to us. That's the problem with art of the current times. And so, you know, there, the, the playwright critic has told Ike that his play is awful, but he's going to make it a bestseller. He's going to make it great. And there's another character who only like is a bit part, and this is somebody called Ibsen, who is known to be a great playwright. And Tui points out to Ike that Ibsen has to fall. And Ike has looked up to Ibsen. He would love to be as great as he, but he knows he's not, he knows he's terrible, but he feels this sense of entitlement that he should be viewed as great as Ibsen, but you can read in the story that when someone else says that, what he was thinking inside, this little ugly corner of his mind, it doesn't sit well with him. And what's interesting about that though, is that, you know, Tui, Tui says to him that you can't, oh, of course I, I have a lot of, wait, did I pick the wrong one? No. Ah, so, so, you know, he says, so Ellsworth is talking a lot of stuff and this is just, I'm gonna read a small little piece here. He says, for in, well, for instance, suppose I don't like Ibsen. Ike interrupts him and says, but Ibsen is good. And Tui says, sure he's good, but suppose I didn't like him. Suppose I wanted to stop people from seeing his plays. It would do me no good whatsoever to tell them so. But if I sold them the idea that you're just as great as Ibsen, pretty soon they wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And Ike says, Jesus, can you? Tui says, it's only an example, Ike, but that would be wonderful. Yes, it would be wonderful. And then it wouldn't matter what they went to see at all. Then nothing would matter neither the writers nor those for whom they wrote. He says this again when he's talking to the main, one of the main characters who he's now destroyed who asked him, what, you do want, what do you want, Tui? And Tui says, power. And, you know, he says that what, what Tui is saying is that if you, if you hear what he's saying there, is he's saying the best way to break down people and to, and to have power over them and stop them from having any kind of self value in themselves is to make the ideal, the great seem mediocre and mundane. If you uplift that which is mediocre, well then people lose the ability to be able to tell 
what should be an ideal for which to strive. And this character, Tui, is like, like I said, I, I think it's, he's really one of the best characters in any novel I've ever read. Like, it's so well done. It's like, even though you really truly don't like him, you have to love him. Like, I don't even know how to describe that. You love him from a literary perspective. And he's talking to someone who's asked him what he wanted and he's describing, he wants to rule the world. And he's discovered that the way to do it is by exactly this, by taking away people's sense of life to use Ayn Rand's words, right? And he says, and this is, I'm looking here now, chapter 12 in book, in part four of The Fountainhead. He says, the soul, Peter, is what can't be ruled. It must be broken. Drive a wedge in, get your fingers in it, and that man is yours. You won't need a whip. He'll bring it to you and ask to be whipped. Kill his inspiration and his integrity. That's difficult. The worst among you gropes for an ideal in his own twisted way. You kill integrity by internal corruption. Use it against itself. Since the supreme ideal is beyond his grasp, I'm sorry, not since once. Once the supreme ideal is beyond his grasp, he gives up eventually all ideals. And that right there is what Ayn Rand, at least from my perspective, is telling us is the vacuum, the aesthetic vacuum. That vacuum is when we pick up book after book or we look at painting after painting and instead of seeing something that makes you feel uplifted in what could be your future or our future collectively as humans, we see something that brings it down, that breaks it down because it's killing our very souls. Remember that Ayn Rand equates our consciousness to our souls? So that's what she finds missing in art today. And I believe that that's the very heart of this small little but very impactful chapter. Thank you. Wonderful, Marisa, thank you. Next up is uh, Sherry. Oh, no, no, sorry, Rob. On the, on the back cover this time for of the Trzynskis. Um, all right, so I, I think that was great, Maritza. I really, yeah, the really perfect passage because it's that idea of, and that's what I think is the really powerful part about it is this idea that if, if all you're getting is the one thing and you're not getting the thing that your soul needs more, then that's the, the, start, the sense of starvation. And I think that's why I, I was gonna take it one passage, one paragraph from this chapter, the aesthetic vacuum of our age that I think really sums up the, the process. So uh, just read this. It, it did not take long for the philosophical roots of naturalism to come out into the open. At first, by the standard that substituted the collective for the objective, the naturalist consigned the exceptional man to unreality and presented only the men who could be taken as typical of some group or another, high or low. Then, since they saw more misery than prosperity on earth, they began to regard prosperity as unreal and to present only misery, poverty, the slums, the lower classes. Then, since they saw more mediocrity than greatness around them, they began to regard greatness as unreal and to present only the mediocre, the average, the common, the undistinguished. Since they saw more failure than success, they took success to be unreal and presented only human failure, frustration, defeat. Since they saw more suffering than happiness, they took happiness to be unreal and presented only suffering. Since they saw more ugliness than beauty, they took beauty to be unreal and presented only ugliness. Since they saw more vice than virtue, they took virtue to be unreal and presented only vice, crime, corruption, perversion, depravity. All right, so this is the idea of the stature of naturalism shrinking from, you know, here's the typical man of the upper classes of the Russian nobility in, 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 in the early 19th century to being down to here's just all the monsters, right? And, and she points out later the irony that the monsters are, um, you know, statistically rare they're not, by any statistical measure of humanity, they're a very small, vanishingly small percentage of people are actual monsters. And yet they take up this enormous amount of uh, uh, extra space in, in the art of the time. Now she's writing this in 1962. And 
I'm going to say a little bit, and I think maybe Joy has more to say about how things have, that things are not exactly the way they were in 1962, but there's also a lot of that 1962 that's still hanging over us. Mm -hmm. So for example, you know, the, the, the television show built around the, uh, the anti-hero or the, you know, the, fo the, 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 the Sopranos effect in TV, that if you have a highbrow television show, your hero has to be a gangster who kills people, right? Again, focusing on the monsters over, over uh, the exceptional monsters over even the ordinary person. Uh, or well, example from here, so about a paragraph after the part I just selected, she has an example here. The subjects of modern literature are such themes as the hopeless love of a bearded lady for a mongoloid pinhead in a circus sideshow. She's got a couple other descriptions like this. So I'm thinking she's got to have a specific novel of the time in mind. So I went to look for, okay, a novel about a bearded lady, the how hard, you know, Google search, it's five seconds away, how hard could it be to find? Well, it was impossible to find. I think Maritza had, the, she's smiling, she had the same experience. It's impossible to find because there've been too many novels about bearded ladies and circus sideshows. There's like one from 2018, there's, there's one from 2010. It, it's a, apparently is a popular subject of contemporary literature is freak shows. <laughs> so again, taking the, uh, the outliers and the unusual and the grotesque and making that the subject, uh, a, 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 a constant subject of art. Now, just to give you an idea of, of how this is still in the culture, I have to, I'm going to torture you a little bit. Uh, I'm going to share oh. the screen here. Now, when we share the screen, does the audio come through as well? It requires a special setting, but we'll, we'll try. Uh, you, what you need to do is that you go to video and in video settings, I think there is a way of oh, in Zoom. Just, yeah. yeah, in Zoom. Uh oh. Well, I already screen shared, so now I'm out of. The okay, room. that's fine. Uh, so uh -oh. you you need you need yeah. the sound. Let me go into video settings. Video yeah. settings. Let me see. Is there? Uh, give me just a second. Um, Sorry about this. I don't remember. They keep moving things. Turn off video. No, always display video. No. Okay, let me just see where the settings are. Mm, just a second. Maybe, maybe it's in share. Give me a second. If, if this, yeah, if yeah. Uh, advanced sharing options. I, I don't see nope, it. Nope, nope. Okay, all right. Sorry. That, that's okay. I think you'll survive. I mean, it's bad enough without the audio. So I think the audio just makes it worse. So I, I can give you a deal. The audio is sort of this weird sort of electronic buzzing that has no okay, tune. Hit share screen. All right, I'll hit share screen again, and we'll go to this one. And I'll share it. And this was, well, okay. So this was a recent modern dance performance. I'll just play it. Okay, I think that's enough. Okay, so the whole thing is only a minute long. I thought, I'm hoping they couldn't I was, see that. I was looking at your special expressions. I figured 45 seconds was enough. Yeah. So it's basically people standing there, not even looking at each other, sort of staring off into space, having some sort of epileptic fit. And I, I described it as a bizarro world version of those original Apple iPod ads that showed like silhouettes of people dancing. <laughs> this is the bizarro world, world version of that. And you'll notice the caption above that somebody put was 2018 is canceled. So this was like early in 2018, but where the video was from, it was from the New York Times, which gave this thing a very positive write-up. So it shows that you have this, you know, the elites of the culture pushing this, this sort of stuff, which, you know, here's the thing. We've talked earlier here about how, um, you know, Ayn Rand isn't necessarily talking about everything that's in art. There are things that are in art that are outside of what she's talking about. But when she talks about the function of art, the metaphysical function of art, the vow, the, the its ability to portray values and have common, meaningful commentary about the world and the ability to show an ideal, that 
when she talks about what the needs are of human consciousness that this serves, when you contrast that to something like what we just saw, you know, the stuff with the bearded lady and then this little dance, so-called dance video that we saw, it's clear that that stuff is not serving those needs. It's leaving those needs unattended to, unaddressed, or in the Mondrian paintings, which are, you know, when I see those blocks of color, of primary colors, it's literally breaking things down to the very simplest sensation. Here's a block of red, here's a block of yellow, here's a block of blue, and not saying anything at all about the world and your place in it, and not serving the basic intellectual and cognitive needs that we that we look to art for. And that's the vacuum that she's talking about. And it is telling that that vacuum is, you know, it was, she was talking about examples from 1962. I, you know, found a bunch from more recently. The vacuum is still there, but. That's the next chapter. The next, well, we're gonna go into the next <laughs> chapter, but what I do wanna mention is that, uh, you know, there are three ways that something can come into the culture. It can come from popular culture. It can come from what we call these days niche culture, which is you know you have fan uh, fans of some particular uh, uh, television show or, or or book or something. You know, people who come together around a common interest. We've got a little niche here. Uh, we call it Shrikantville, uh, a group of people who you know, Shrikant brings together. Um, and then there's elite culture, which is culture that is promulgated by the New York Times or by universities or foundations mm -hmm. or uh, you know, uh, by major elite institutions. And what we've seen since 19, the big difference between now and 1962 is the elite institutions are still putting out a lot of the same stuff they were promoting, before, you know, at the time she was writing. Uh, what's happened is that the, I think the big, and the popular culture is still doing a lot of the stuff that it's doing that isn't necessarily as often as the opposite of what the elite culture is doing. And I think we're going to talk a lot about that in, in next week. But what's really changed since 1962, in my view, is the niche culture, is that niche culture has become much, much more powerful because of the advances in telecommunications, advances in the internet, that it's much easier to establish a niche and for people who in a, in a niche to find each other and communicate with each other and for things to thrive in their niches uh, without needing the support of either the popular culture uh, or the elite culture, and sometimes to go from a niche out into the popular culture if it's something that's really valuable uh, and it really catches people's imagination. So I think that's the, the, the uh, and, and actually to some extent, you know, I think that the uh, elite culture has in its way just become another niche. Like for example, that dance performance I tortured, tortured you with for about mm -hmm. half a minute. I doubt more than a thousand people saw that actual performance, right? Can it, you just... uh, other than the video, I mean, in person, in, in terms of live and in person going to see it, I would be shocked if more than a thousand people did that. That is a niche thing that only gets elevated above that because it's got big and powerful institutions, often with a lot of money that are broadcast, that are trying to promote it. But it is really just becoming another niche for people in this highbrow world or for people in the elite institutions to share amongst themselves that, you know, and when it gets out, goes out on the Twitter, it, it probably got a thousand times more views on Twitter by people making fun of it. All right, so, uh, so uh, that's, I think the, the sort of hope is that, that uh, the, the more positive part of today's culture in my view is that the niche culture and the ability of something that doesn't fit with these elite preconceptions to be able to exist and to, to, to find an audience has greatly increased. Thanks, Rob. Next up is Joya. Well, this has been a very depressing panel so far. So I hopefully want to come here at the end and, and maybe put more of a positive spin on what we're talking about. And to me, honestly, the most interesting thing about this chapter is that it's made me ask the question, what is the status of the age we are living in? So Ayn Rand called this the aesthetic vacuum of our age, but her age is not our age. And I first read this book in the mid nineties. And even since the mid nineties to now, it's fascinating to me how much our culture is developing in a way that I think really takes us far from how things were in the early 60s. And I'm going to pick up on some things that, that Rob was talking about. Um, you know, I, I love what he's bringing up about you know the, the, the way that niche culture has 
just accumulated and, and provided this, this real abundance, I think of both the positive and the negative. And to me, the big question for dealing with aesthetics in our age is how to find the good stuff. Because to me, I think that that is the real question that we face, that with the internet, it is possible to experience so many works of art, even in terms of the, what I often consider the 80-20 of experiencing an artwork. So for example, Sherry led us through this amazing tour of, of art history, looking through all these different Mondrian works. And just imagine what it would have been like if this were the 1920s and we wanted to do something similar. Uh, she would have literally had to have taken us to you know, a variety of different museums, or maybe we would have just had some poor kinds of photocopies to see this. So the internet makes possible to, to have this kind of amazing tour of art history. And of course, it's not like actually going to see the real works of art. I'm always someone who believes that there is something powerful and magical about seeing the work in its original form. But I'm also a believer in the 80-20, that I think we do get 80% of what Mondrian has to offer us by, by having Sherry lead us through an internet tour of his works. And this is just the amazing opportunity that the internet and, and our age makes possible. So for me, the real question is, how do we navigate this? And to me, this really is a question, one that I feel I have not answered well for my life. Admittedly, the way that I have tried to deal with the overabundance of what is out there has not been as good as it could be, I don't think. I don't really have anything like a system or a method or a way to think about how to, to deal with everything that's out there. My, my own approach has been eclectic at best. Usually what happens is I, I have friends who recommend something, so I go seek that out. And then maybe from, from that book or that work, it, it leads me to look at something else. But it's been just a, a kind of eclectic hodgepodge. And I think I really could do better to, to really maximize the value of art's possibility. So that's really the question that I want to bring to the panel and, and to all everybody in the audience is to think about, to ask you, how do you deal with just the amazing richness of what's out there? How do you weed the, the signal from the noise and maximize the potential that, that we can experience as consumers of art in the 2020s? Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Joria. So now the panelists get a chance to ask questions of each other. So Joria has put some questions on the table. Does anybody want to? Take a stab. Yeah, sure. I, I thank you, Joya. Um, that was wonderful. I, I really um, struggled with wanting to circle it back around to the end. Um, Ayn Rand was um, writing at a very distinct time, and uh, it was hard for her to see what might come from it. Um, and to kind of tie into what Joya was saying of how do you find things. I'm going to put a little shout out here to the Art Renewal site. It's Art, Art Renewal Center. Art Renewal Center. I believe their website is artrenewal.org. Um, started by someone um, I, I met 30 years ago. Sadly, just last week, he has passed. He is one of the co-founders of this site. His name was Brian Yoder. Um, but what they started with back then and it's it's it was it was meant essentially to be um a museum of realist or romantic realist paintings and it grew to art of all types it grew to sculpture eventually it grew to competitions um and schools um and scholarships and all sorts of things so if you're looking for a place to go find a museum um, instead of looking through everything that's out there. This is a nice, really wonderful online museum way of you can look by an individual painter or individual sculptor um, and really kind of get a full picture. What they did was cutting edge at the time when they started it uh, with super high resolution photographs, uh, which makes a huge difference when you're looking at 
a painting um, of somebody who's really known for their brush strokes and you can't see the brush strokes, you're really losing a lot. So this was a way of uh, doing that. So that would be my answer of how, the best way to kind of weed through things is to try to find these sources like the art renewal site that allow you to um, have a concentrate. It's like, it's like going to the specialty store. You know, you can, you can, there's so much there alone. Um, you can spend a lot of time and obviously you'll be able to find out where individual paintings and sculptures and works of art are located. So when you're on your travels, you can go see them in person. But um, I think you're gonna get a lot farther doing that than just wandering through museums, hoping that you're gonna find a, a great piece. And I thought you were going to do a pitch for things of beauty because oh that yes. was, uh, Sherry used you to can do, do that. <laughs> so Sherry used to do for my newsletter used to do a column called things of beauty and it would be finding some image on the internet of a piece of work of art or sometimes a piece of music but sometimes, sometimes tools a, sometimes a beautifully made tool and then write you know show an image of it, link to an image of it and then write something about that and uh, uh, I've been I lost her to other her other work. But I'm trying to get. It, I've been poking her to try to get that set up on He's its own. He's dragging thing. me back. <laughs> yes, but it was you know the idea of having somebody who's out there because you know the, the great um, the, the great thing about the web is there's this enormous amount of information available for free, and the terrible thing about the web is there's this enormous amount of information available for free, and how do you ever make your way through it? So you need people who are going to be, uh, and the technical term is aggregators, people who are going to be out there trawling through everything and finding the good stuff and bringing it to you. And uh, Sherry used to do that. I'm hoping you're trying to get her to do that again. And um, <laughs> there's one other person who the does that. The pressure uh, builds. Uh, yeah, so the, you know, it's finding some other people, some people who do that is, is uh, or find, trying to find a source that does that is, is one of the things that's very helpful. Somebody who's actually out, out there finding stuff for you that's interesting to bring in. It's like a guided tour. Yeah. I have, I have a slightly different perspective. Uh, so firstly, uh, I want to um, piggyback on what Rob was saying that I, I think of it purely in numbers. You know, number of people, number of people in the world is much larger than 1960s. The ability to connect to them is about thousand to a million times more. Um, what they are producing is of that order. So it's, it's just a just lot of stuff out there. So, and just like, the church during the Renaissance and afterwards, it did not die, but it was supplanted by economic activity around it. So that it, instead of being kind of the center of civilization, civilization kind of happened around it and it became less and less relevant. The same thing happens to elites. You know, there is just so much going on outside of it. And I think identification of a niche is basically it's like a separate islands, you know, different islands developing because even for a small group of people, it, it is possible to do things together, which was not possible before because the communication ability, financial ability did not exist. So even the phenomena of niches, this ex explosion of niches is the result of more people, more connected, more wealth, you know, more, more ability to do things. So it's a wonderful, world. So there is a lot of stuff going on. Now, my simple idea, it's a very radical idea. It's again connected with the idea of being a producer instead of a consumer. The way you consume best is by producing stuff. So if you want to do good writing, just do a lot of good writing. And what you will find is that actually good writers will keep finding you. Like for example, I like discussions. So I organize these discussions and people who want to discuss things, who want to talk, just show up. You know, yes, you know, I do a little bit of search, but then a whole bunch of people show up and they bring their own search. And all I have to do is to do this and just people show up. So similarly, I think if you take the approach of saying, instead of saying, okay, how do I find good stuff? You start producing good stuff in massive quantities. And that serves as you, so you become one of those nodes where people actually find you. And then people will say, you know what? You are like that other person. So it's like tremendously magnifying. So I wouldn't look at art as from consumer perspective, 
but from producer perspective. Um, I wanna throw in here a, um, a plug for more modern style types of fiction. In the science fiction and the paranormal side, just because if you've ever picked up, and I hate the labeling system of bookstores, but that's a whole different topic. But they have a section that's called, it's called urban literature. And they relegate fiction, science fiction, not quite science fiction. So it's fiction novels that are talking about dystopian societies. But if you read them, you pick up, or invariably almost any book you pick up, even if it's a self-published book, you pick it up and you read it. And if, it's, if that's the genre, what it is, is it's got this ragtag bunch of mixed race people or beings or aliens, and they are figuring out how to survive in a new world reality. And I find it to be fascinating that that genre is, it's, I don't think it's like super popular yet, but in the last, I want to say five to 10 years, I just see an uptick in it. And I know a few, you know, starving artists who, who are the producers of these works. And I've had the, the pleasure and the honor of editing them or helping them get them published. And it's just, it's to me, it's an example of maybe a little tiny bit of a turning of the corner for us in a small way, because this is art. And this is art that is doing something that Ayn Rand has said has been missing because it's showing us what ought to be, what could be, what we could be. And, and like every, the, the moral of every one of these stories is that yes, human, you can survive, you will survive some, you know, EMP or nuclear blast or famine or virus. And it's just, I don't know, they're fascinating. And I know that it's like a weird little niche genre as it were in literature, but I just wanted to point that out that if you, just think a little bit outside the box. There's different things. I know that most people wouldn't think to pick up that type of book, but in it, you do find that little piece that is uplifting to the soul. Any of the panelists have any more questions? Uh, I want to get to, see today we have got a hard stop at five o'clock because Brad uh, is going to be here talking about the American mind. Um, so what I want to do is I want to do, uh, I let me just open up for, uh, unless anybody has a, any of the panelists has a burning question, I'm going to open it up. Uh, we can go to uh, breakout rooms, let people discuss the questions, the big, big questions. So let's, let's put the questions on the table for the breakout rooms. So firstly, do you agree that there, do you think that there is an aesthetic vacuum today? Okay, so this is kind of taking the theme of Ayn Rand and observation of Joya. Is there a aesthetic vacuum today? Second question is how do you navigate to find what you need? What are your strategies for doing that? So those are the two big questions I would like to discuss in the breakout rooms. And then we'll do breakout rooms only for 20 minutes and then we'll come back, we'll share our strategies and handle questions at that time. And we are also going to take some questions uh, you know, there will have a section for questions from the past with Jonathan, uh, Jonathan is going to put on the table. All right, so that's what is coming up. So I'm going to start, give me just a second here. So now uh, let's go for uh, takeaways. Two big questions, you know, what did you learn from, from the meetup today? Um, what do you think about the stat state of the culture in terms of aesthetic vacuum? And what are your strategies for getting the art that you need? So if you wanna share your takeaways, go ahead and type uh, exclamation mark in Zoom um, and let's go from there. And we will have time for deliberately set it up so that we have plenty of time now to do not only just takeaways, but we'll discuss questions. And then we will take some general questions for any part of the series after that. Rupali, you're first, go ahead. Thank you, Shrikant, and to all the panelists for another wonderful presentation. And Sherry, that was fantastic. Um, 
presentation of how you walked us through the sequence. Um, it was really helpful. I'm looking forward to the uh, things of beauty uh, again. You know, it, we have some of the tools that you prompted us to purchase subverse, you know, with all the, I would read and I would say, oh, we need to have this tool. <laughs> so that's one thing. But I wanted to share my takeaway is that, you know, um, we are living in this world and this is our age. So we are not separate from the aesthetics of our age. So how are we contributing? We are the creators of the aesthetics of this age. So we are not waiting for somebody else to create it for us. So that's one uh, thought I had. The second is um, that uh, when, when we are talking about literature that nourish and fuel our soul, art that nourishes and helps us find our sense of life, then um, what are, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to find some of, um, it's hard to find artwork or literature that perhaps uplifts us to that level that uh, Hugo or Ayn Rand or some of the other Greek arts that we've seen in the past. But uh, there are nuggets out there and we have to find those nuggets. It's not made popular by the media, not made popular by the universities, but those nuggets exist. And how do we find those are the, is, is, the, is the question. Thank you. Wonderful. So what we can do is that the as the number of people is not that large, we can go ahead and keep on responding to things that people bring up. So, uh, so folks, or you can put your takeaways and put your questions, then we'll address the questions and go on. We have time for that. So one thing I want to say is that um, I think I absolutely agree that you create your own aesthetics. That's your responsibility. It's your life. You can't simply just complain, oh, my culture is not giving me. No, 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 that's not, that's too passive away. You will notice that when Ayn Rand was writing Atlas or Fountainhead, she had no time for all of that because she was actually creating the work. And in the process of creating art, you are actually living in the kind of world that you want to live in. So you are actually recreating that. So um, definitely that. Uh, does anybody else want to wants, want to respond to Rupali? Any of the panelists? Nope. Okay. Oh, I, I'll jump right. in and say, I think that that's beautifully put. Uh, you are the one that you've been waiting for. That, that, that's the message I think everyone should take away. You know, if, if you think there is a vacuum, then go fill it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, next up is going to be Jonathan, followed by Lloyd. Jonathan. Yeah, so I got a couple of things uh, that I took away for, from today. So, um, well, Sherry's art linked to this art on your website. I just checked it out. It was amazing. And then, <clears throat> you know, like Shrikant mentioning uh, creating, and, and I, I see that as connecting to a concept I've heard called working out loud. So whatever you're working on, share it with other people to draw them in. Um, and that's just more confirmation on that. And then Maritza's connection with of this essay, uh, aesthetic vacuum of our uh, age to the fountainhead, I found really interesting. Um, and the other thing I think the main takeaway for me is, uh, I think it's really important to conceptualize what you're seeing. Cause I remember having the experience of not being able to do that in school and just being traumatized by reading about you know, some people living in a village and one committing suicide, one with one eye, the other one drunk. And I was just like, I, I just thought all literature was crap. I didn't understand any of this. I was like, what is this stuff? And I realized that if I had been given words to conceptualize what that was and what I was seeing and what else was available, I would have maybe started reading way earlier. So that it just sort of reinforced that for me. Thank you. Uh, does any, do any of the panelists want to respond? Okay, we'll, we'll continue. We'll respond to everything. Rob has something. Yes. Well, you know, one of the things that I, I, I you talk about, you know, if, if you don't like the way the culture is, create your own art. And I'm not sure I'm going to be able to create my own art. And, you know, I've got enough other things to do. But the one thing that I think can be an adjunct to that, though, is educating people about art. And to go back to the passage from the Fountainhead that Maritza read is that you know, when people are told by the, the critics and the highbrow people and the educators, 
oh, only look at this. And you know, you, you end up doing what Jonathan's talking about. You read some of this stuff and say, oh, that, I, this doesn't appeal to me. And you just a little, you walk away and you leave it. Mm -hmm. And you don't have the words, you don't have the background, you don't have the range of different examples that would help you to explore that. So simply somebody who helps people build back the, the vocabulary and the, the, the knowledge of how, of what's going on in the art and the ability to see all the details and being an educator, a booster for the good art that is, you know, because we have, we don't have access just to the art of our era. We have access to the art of 5,000 years of human wow. civilization. Uh, and, you know, through Google or in a museum or wherever else. So having somebody who's able to say, you know, first of all, here's the stuff, the good stuff to go see or to read. And also, here's where it's coming from. Here's the idea behind it. Here's what to look for. Here's how to understand the building blocks of that the that the the artist or the musician or whatever is using to communicate with you can really open up much a much greater understanding of art in people's minds and a greater appreciation of it. I just want to uh, piggyback really quickly on that. Is that also you yourself? If you walk by a building that you think is just architecturally stunning, tell your friend, tell two friends, and they'll tell somebody else. If you see a piece of art that's interesting, put a plug. I make jokes that I like this so much, I'd make a commercial for it. But that's what we need. Do that. You know, if, if we, you know, there's, it's, I don't know if you've ever read the book Tipping Point, but you know, they talk about, you know, one plus two plus three, many, you know, so just if you see something that in your mind is a great work of art, share it. Tell somebody else to go look at it because one by one by one, we can get a bigger group of people seeing it. The other point I would make is that I think people have habitual way of consuming things. I mean, the thing that really astonishes me is that whenever I look at the stats of people watching TV, Americans watching TV, the average is like four hours a day. Okay, and most of them think that there is nothing on TV worth watching. Like a lot of them think that. So the question is, why? It's like, you know, you have this entire access with the internet to everything, everything, all the culture, all the art of all times, and you're still trying to consume it. So you have to come up with a strategy and time, you know, your way of consuming to just focus on things that, that you uh, want to consume. Go ahead. Okay, uh, next up. Can I, go can ahead. I on that? Um, one thing that um, I can tie into Srikant's life a little bit here. Um, when Srikant moved out of uh, his Chicago apartment, which was what, four times bigger than your permanent now? Yes. Yeah, he had to weed out his books. He had to get rid of an awful lot of books. Um, and I remember having conversations with him about, well, I can only have the best books because that's all the space that he had. Well, that's really what we need to do. We need to say, okay, the whole world is full of stuff. I need to take my time, give it to the best stuff, the most fulfilling stuff because you know, Real Housewives or whatever city, <laughs> <laughs> which I've never even seen yeah. because I don't have time for it. You have, your time is valuable. Put it where it makes sense to put it. Okay. I just want to uh, give you an update on that, Sherry. On your book? So I, yes. I'd reduced it to 1,700 books when I moved to New York. Yeah. And I moved, I decided to reduce from 1,700 down to 400 books. And what Ooh. I did, yeah. So that was even, yes. And, but that what I did was that I cheated. I cheated. I got, I got the, my favorite people in New York to come to my library to pick out books that they wanted to take. So all, all my great books are sitting in people's, you know, all the other books, which are my second level books are sitting with people who are actually going to read it and going to talk to me about them at, at various times. So uh, sorry about the uh, digression, but that was interesting. Next up is going to be Lloyd, Alex, Great Hard and Rupali. Lloyd. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to mention, uh, when I was reading this chapter, one thing struck me um, as false. Uh, Ayn Rand says in the second paragraph, man is a being who possesses the faculty of volition, did not appear in literature until the 19th century. 
Uh, that's not true. That's actually false because um, aside from Shakespeare, there are a lot of other playwrights in the Elizabethan uh, era. Uh, for example, Christopher Marlowe with Dr. Faustus and the Jew of Malta and Robert Greene stuff. And of course, after that, the restoration comedies, William Congreve, and at the end of the 1700s, you've got School for Scandal by um, uh, Richard Brinsley Sheridan. And all those characters demonstrate volition. Uh, they get into relationships, they, they explore marriage, the game of love. So that statement is, is definitely false. Uh, I don't know if anybody picked up on that. Maybe Joya did or folks who know literature better. But uh, take a look if you have any doubt. I mean, don't look at Shakespeare. There are other playwrights besides Shakespeare in the 1500s, 1600s, and 1700s. So that's, uh, that's false. I just wanted to establish that. Um, secondly, I would say that, uh, you know, I, there are enough good previous works to spend time with. I mean, I understand there is a vacuum now, but uh, you don't want to, since our time is limited, you don't want to spend too much time railing against that or trying to introduce it back into the society. There's enough good stuff out there that uh, you could focus on um, as far as art. So, you know, I'd recommend taking a class in art history and uh, learn for yourself about some of the past masters and, um, you know, see some of those plays that you may not know about. Uh, Dr. Faust is a great play. Um, and unfortunately, you can't go by Broadway because they keep remaking the same stuff. I mean, that's a, that's a wasteland. Uh, most, for most of the part, keep redoing the same plays for commercial uh, benefit. So you kind of have to look like off-Broadway, off-off-Broadway. Um, you're not going to find it uh, in mainstream theater, uh, except the same stuff regurgitated. Thank you, Lloyd. Uh, does anybody want to respond, especially about the first point? Um, I have something to say about that. And, and just a quick comment about Broadway too, because I absolutely share your frustration that, that so much of what we see on Broadway now is just like, oh, we took this movie and we're going to make it a Broadway play. But there are exceptions. And I'll just point out Hamilton is one of my absolute favorites, which has come out in just the past couple of years. So, so I, I have hope even for Broadway. But I wanted to answer the volition point. I, I think this is an example. Sherry has said before that sometimes it seems Ayn Rand is talking in shorthand. And I think this is an example of this because I would say certainly if, if we look back at the nature of human beings anthropologically, we would you know, see that volition has been around for centuries, if not thousands of years. And there's certainly examples of that, I think throughout literature and, and the arts more broadly. But when Ayn Rand's talking about volition, this came out more in some of the earlier um, chapters we just did just before this, where she she's really looking at volition in its highest expression. She talks about volition in terms of both consciousness and action and how that's brought together in terms of a great plot. And for her, she really sees the apotheosis of this in the 19th century. So I, I, my, my sense is that's what she was talking about when she makes just this shorthand comment here. I want to also say that, you know, you, because you pointed out um, Dr. Faust um, specifically, I, I don't find that that is a tale of um, volition. I mean, you know, even in the very end, you know, when the, when the, the devil drags him off, he says, and I don't remember the exact quote, but something along the facts is, you know, you're, you're a man, so you're destined to die or something like that is what he says. And to me, that's a very deterministic statement. So it, maybe that's just just what I'm seeing there. Okay, um, let's uh, let's not go into a particular thing too much uh, because the other people may not be familiar with it, so they will not have any basis to to go back and forth. But I I'll, I'll, what I want to say is that volition is a huge huge topic. It's a very difficult topic, uh, both at a philosophical level and in dramatizing it in art. So there are kind of lower levels, I mean, just like Joya was saying, there are kind of lower levels and there are higher levels. So there is, you know, Antigone trying to make a decision between things. You can see some things, but then there is Dostoevsky, 
where the portrayal of the self-consciousness, um, it's at a completely different level. Um, or Victor Hugo of just seeing what is possible inside the head and connecting that to plot everything. So, so there are different uh, levels uh, of volition. Next up is Alex, followed by Great Heart. Alex. I, um, I want to bring a little bit of uh, Asian uh, kind of angle into this. Um, I want to refer to the movie uh, by Wang Gawei. Um, the director Wang Gao, he made a movie called The Grandmasters, which is a study of, uh, of uh, uh, martial arts uh, masters in, in, in uh, Asia, uh, and based on the biography of Yip Man, who is the master of uh, Bruce Lee. So the, in, the movie, of course, is beautifully made, but what it really is talking about is talking about the philosophy and the up of the obligation of passing down, you know, traditions to the next generation. Right. So, so when when Yip Man was in in he was in China. It was he lives in the southern part of China, and when the war broke out, first world war broke out, Japan came into uh, uh, to occupy um, because he. He had he has a he had a very high, this is a true story he had a very high sta status in the uh, martial arts world and he felt the obligation that he needed to pass it down so eventually he parted he actually parted with his family um, sent them back to where uh, his wife uh, first came from and he you know uh, 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 escaped uh, to Hong Kong uh, and from there. Uh, because of um, he, his, his belief that he must pass down this tradition, the obligation to the next generation. And he actually made a new philosophy, um, a kind of a new thought that he, he believes that it doesn't matter, you know, which direction you go, north, south, east, or west, you know, as long as, you know, somebody wants to learn it. So in the movie, there's this, there's this reference to light, you know, if there's somebody lighting that lamp, there will, people will come. Just like this meeting, mm -hmm. you know, you are, uh, Shri Khan, you are, you are, you are the, the one who is holding the light and for people to come and to try to pass down these, you know, traditional ideas to, to, you know, next generation. And Thank of course- you, Alex, could you put a link uh, or something in the chat so people can know more about it? or uh, just uh, the names uh, of, of the movies uh, in, in the uh, chat so people can follow yeah. up on that. Thank yeah. you. Yes, and oh. I, I just, I'm sorry. I just want to finish the story really quick. Um, that, um, so, so when, um, when Bruce Lee uh, learned this philosophy from Yip Man and Bruce Lee came to America, the reason why Americans was so, he kind of made it so popular in America is he took Yip Man's philosophy that, that this, this art, you know, because martial art is a kind of art, should be, uh, uh, he, he's obligated. He has, he, he needs to uh, uh, pass it down to as many people as possible. So, um, and he made it really popular, of course, you know, international and everything. So I, I kind of just want to share that story that, you know, I hope, you know, um, those who are able to, because, you know, not everyone is able to, but those who are able to, you know, like Shikhan, you know, you know, light that lamp and light the light and so that other people could come and because like, you know, I did not know anything about this meeting until I got really bored at home you know? and I'm really thankful for that. And I, I'm hoping that, you know, more, more meetings like this, uh, uh, you know, around the world, not just in here, you know. Um, Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Alex. Really appreciate that. And um, I think it is actually very interesting to look at the kind of the Chinese approach to this, especially martial arts. You know, it, there is a tradition there of kind of connection between the highest ideas and actual action and kind of building those ideas into action. We saw that in our meetup on UDA just a couple of hours ago, 
uh, because they were saying that this is just natural to martial arts and the military is trying to still parse it and figure it out of this kind of unification between the intuitive uh, and the implicit with the explicit um, and philosophical all together as one unit. So uh, great point, thank you very much. Uh, next up is going to be Great Heart. So I had a just a few thoughts. First of all, this is not my area at all and I'm really enjoying it. Uh, I have delved in it over the years off and on, but uh, just a couple observations. Uh, first of all, I'm reading a book just by chance at the moment on uh, German romanticism of 19th century. And one point that was made in that book is that some of the progenitors of that movement presented criticism as art. Criticism can be art. So I think that this uh, Ayn Rand, you know, I accept that as maybe there's some, I don't know what criticism is as opposed to art, but there's, uh, I, I see it as an artistic approach, not necessarily entirely valid. In other words, you learn something about Ayn Rand as much as you learn about art from reading this. And the um, couple other observations about what she said, but these are just, again, reflections. Uh, if you fault the vacuum of the present, I think that there might be some telescope. One needs to, I, in my opinion, one needs to appreciate the telescoping that happens when you look back into the past. Because if you look back into the past, you might pull forward centuries of artwork or decades of artwork, and you can uh, visualize it or imagine it all at once. Now we have a decade's worth of artwork and you can't imagine it all at once. You imagine it over a decade. So it might seem like a vacuum. Uh, the other thing that can create a vacuum is that there's more of a proliferation of platforms now Whereas in the past there were fewer, uh, and getting onto those platforms, you know, might have been a little harder. The attention was more focused, and things became maybe more famous, more durable. I don't know about that. Then the last thing I would say that I think there is something to the in terms of what the vacuum might be, and this harks back to what uh, something I learned once from watching a series of lectures by Christopher Clive. He's a uh, an art historian uh, uh, focusing on architecture. Uh, he gave a series of lectures. He gave a series of lectures in the, in the London subway during the bombing of London, during the Blitzkrieg. He taught art history in the subways. And uh, he, re he also then put together a series of videos that I bought as DVDs. They're, you know, it's very extensive. And I thought they were very good. The what he says he does not like, like modernity so, you know, that all I can say is Ayn Rand might be a little bit echoing that. Um, in that modernity focuses on usefulness as opposed to aesthetics or beauty. And maybe there's a bit of that in, in what, uh, I don't remember everybody's name in the presentation, but we cite Modrian and all that, getting down to the essentials, uh, what, you know, costs the least and gets, you know, is the most useful. So maybe there's uh, there's something in that. Thank you, thank you. Uh, does anybody, uh, any of the panelists wants, want to respond to that? Um, I, I, yes, I would like to, from the very beginning, you were talking about criticism as art and that we learn as much about Ayn Rand as we do about art in this. And that's very much the case. She mentions that in the earlier chapters. Um, I don't think she mentions it specifically as you're gonna learn as much about me <laughs> but she's talking about um, that in all art that uh, there is the reaction of there is there is what the artist puts out there and there is the discussion or the the back and forth that happens of whoever the viewer the reader the listener is and they re and it's it's really it's it's a dance you've got both sides there um, and totally different sidebar here. Rob and I were talking um, earlier in the week, but in some cases you also have um, this element of who's producing it, who is, who's funding it, um, which we may be getting into at some future date, mm -hmm. but, um, and you'll see that too throughout uh, all of art history, architecture, literature, 
um, there is there, that's a reflection of what's happening too. Wonderful. Uh, next up is going to be Rupali. Rupali, go ahead. So um, one of the things that you know uh, I often come across is why uh, people will say that oh I like the book uh, Atlas Shrugged or Fountainhead, but the characters are not practical. And I think in this chapter she kind of illustrates the the prevalent idea that humans are not capable of achieving higher goals and cannot have you know if we, if you don't really um, know that humans are uh, capable of it then virtue or achieving goals is just by chance or by fluke so i feel this uh, the sentence in her book uh, if men hold a rational philosophy including the conviction that they possess volition the image of a hero guides them and inspires them so to, to be a reasonable person takes effort and it takes time to think and process. That's something probably is missing in uh, the education field. And so going back to Rob's thought about educating, you know, you may not be a creator, but can educate people to, to think, to, um, to learn to do things for themselves. Uh, I think will also, it takes time and it takes a lot of effort and which is why I feel these characters seem impractical to, to many um, people. Any of the panelists wants, want to comment? Just Go uh, ahead. real quick, I don't think it's in this book, but Ayn Rand actually has a work of art that she, um, work of art, no, it's an essay that she did. It's called Art and Education. Just wanted to suggest that to you because I think you would find it to be very interesting. All right. Uh, so thank you, uh, Marisa. Thank you, Rupali. So what we are going to do now is we are going to kind of step back because we have we have a session that we normally start after this meetup. So we are preponing that into this meetup, and that is uh, led by Jonathan, and he has sent me three three series of questions. Uh, and his questions are like multi-part questions. So I'm going to try to simplify it. And John, uh, Jonathan, uh, feel free to kind of expand on that. So uh, there are three, three questions, but the theme that is there across all the three questions. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to put together the theme so we can discuss this one large issue. Essentially, it is asking that is there something like learning to appreciate art? Like there are some, you know, there are, for, for some art, there is an immediate reaction and you say, oh, I like it. But then there is something, is there something like, does anybody have the experience of working very hard to try to understand an art piece that they don't initially enjoy, but later did? So that's one version of it. The second version of it is, uh, what is it that, what is it that makes a particular novel hard to read or difficult to read or easy to read. Uh, the third version of it is just like Mortimer Adler talks about reading nonfiction and we've done multiple meetups on that. Is there something like how to read fiction to get the most value out of it? So is there something that you can do to appreciate art better? So this is a question for the panelists first and then uh, anybody else who wants to comment just on this, so we're just talking about this topic. So Sherry or Rob. Wait, does, yeah. does Jonathan wanna just elaborate on his questions at all first? Sure, uh, Jonathan, you wanna add anything? Uh, no, I can paste them in the chat. And by the way, the first two, they're joyous and I really like your questions, so I, I put them in, but I'll paste, I'll just put them in the chat for reference. Oh, thank you, thank you, Joya, for the questions. Really appreciate that. Great questions. Yes. Um, well, I, I was just trying to synthesize what I saw in Jonathan's questions and pull, and pull some something nice out. Nice job. Nice job. Okay. Uh, uh, so in that case, in if, if Joya, those are your questions partly. Do you want to add anything to it? Because I want to kind of, I want to unify them and put it as like one large issue that we have. Do you want to add anything to the question itself? I, I think you stated it beautifully. So if I was going to summarize it, I, I would just say um, like, maybe you know, if we're starting from zero, what are the things that we have to know or learn or do to be able to really get the most out of a work of art? 
Okay. All right. So Shari goes first, and then anybody else who wants to comment, including all the attendees, are welcome to do that. You can go ahead and type exclamation mark uh, in Zoom to do that. Shari. Mm -hmm. um, so the first thing I would say is that's getting at that one part of your question um, of do you ever have a situation where you need to um, to to work to learn about the art before you get the value from it before you have that um, sense of life reaction. And most definitely, yes. I think um, it's good to think of this as um, maybe in, in degrees. So if a work of art is uh, hitting on all cylinders, let's use, let's throw a bunch of mixed metaphors in here. If it hits on all of your sense of life cylinders, if it's got everything that just drives it home to you, probably you're gonna just react emotionally with instantaneously without needing to study or learn about it. But if it's something that maybe catches your eye or you like part of it or something draws you to it, um, spending time learning about the work of art, not just the history behind it, but the time to understand um, how to see what you're looking at. Um, and I'm talking really more visual arts, uh, sculpture, uh, painting, that sort of thing. Um, Maritza and Joya can talk more about literature, I'm sure, um, or in, in architecture too. It, it generally will have that sort of some level of draw to you, then it's worth, I think, taking the time to dig into why. What is it about it that is making that reaction. And also I find this, if this is something you're interested in, um, I find it strangely illuminating to do the same level when you're strongly repulsed by something, to find out why is this really this repulsive to me? Within reason, of course, because like we said, you know, you, your life is only so long. Do you really want to spend that amount of time on that? <laughs> but there is, um, there's times when you can take a, enough time to research or look into, sometimes it's just introspection. Why is this work of art this repulsive to me? And answering those questions is teaching you more about what is happening on, on, the, on the good side of a reaction to a work of art. Wonderful. I, I want to add a couple of things. Uh, firstly, I want to add, I'm a very big proponent of taking in massive amount of art. Mm -hmm. So one of the biggest things that I do for visual arts is that, and I do this with friends who visit uh, New York and Jonathan, when you come to New York, let's do that. Um, we take, I take them to the Met over here and we walk through all the paintings. So first we just walk through, right? The entire collection. Okay. And you, Go ahead. I would get one room in and need to take a break. Yes, no, I, 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 it's not, that's not how my mind works. It's I like, know. I'm saying there is this entire museum. I need to get the whole thing in. Otherwise I'm going to miss something. Okay. So I, I go through the whole thing. Okay. And you have reactions. So you can keep, keep track of all the reactions. You go through the whole thing choose few things that really produce strong reactions to you. And then you go back, look at them. You go back and look at them, go back and look at them and start comparing, you know, try to ask yourself, but what happens is that just by juxtapositioning of all these things, just like what Sherry did with her presentations of visual arts, you can see the progression. You can see things along different dimensions. And those become more, you become more explicitly aware of it. So a lot of it is kind of, it starts at the implicit level, intuitive level, and you're, you're trying to make it explicit. Once it becomes explicit, the intuitive part becomes even stronger. So it's a, it's a loop. So one point I want to make about appreciation of art is just massive, the same, a massive quantity. Same applies to music. So for example, I'm into Indian classical music. Massive amount of good music is what you really need in order to hone your ability to, to sing or to appreciate. Um, and then you will start, once you have that 
any new piece that comes in, you can say, oh, this is kind of sounds similar, but it's not. The person can't actually do good art. So your standards keep on rising as you keep, you know, so, so quantity is something that I would recommend. Joya. I want to just jump in and say, um, Jonathan, whenever you can come to the U.S., I think we should plan a field trip to the Met and uh, Shri Khan can lead it. And hopefully we can get uh, Sherry and Rob to come up to New York City for that weekend. And we can just do a big, big, uh, big Met field trip. I'm down. Can you comment on Shri Khan's, uh, uh, what Shri Khan, what you just mentioned about taking in the value of art? Um, I actually, I actually kind of, uh, 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 have an extension to that um, because uh, my daughter, she loves classical music. And then, and then this is what happens to me actually as well. I, probably a lot of people have also experienced that, you know, once you're taking a mass amount and you started to become, started to become kind of expert, you know, then all of a sudden you feel like, oh my God, that's, that's a terrible version. You know, like, like you, you actually, you actually become more limited, you know, like, like I could, like, I can tell, you know, which one is a good Chopin pianist, you know, like I can start to tell and I said, and I'm thinking, well, is, is that really good for me or not? You know, cause my daughter is now getting into this classical music and all that. So I told her, you know, don't listen to it too much because in the end you might not enjoy it, you know, and you know, you only could be confined to, because there's so many of them and, um, you started, you, 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 it, it's, it's just like what Shrikan mentioned, you, know, you become intuitively, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, have preference to what you like, what you don't like. And as things, as you become more and more expert in these subjects, you, you, you actually become, I feel, that's my personal opinion, like a little bit confined. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, so I want to add just one thing and then uh, I will throw it to Rupali. Um, so one of the things that are on literature, so I, we talked about visual arts, we talked about music. I also want to add literature. So one of the favorite things that Leonard Peikoff did that I really liked was after he finished his opar, he said, I want to do something I really, really love. Okay, and that is literature. So he did this series on, I think it was, uh, it was the great plays. So he chose eight, eight plays. Great plays. Yes. Uh, it shows plays across time. And that was stunning. That is stunning. You know, even if you just read those, it was eight plays, was it? Okay, so just eight plays across time. Because what it does is that it shows you the range of expression. It shows you the difference of styles. It just on every, and plays are, are actually most effective uh, literature to read because they're so short. And um, you, if you can find good, you know, um, performances of it, nothing like it, but it allows you to do a quick comparison and you will find something about literature that you would not do otherwise. I'm not talking about the course, but just the experience of reading the plays together. The both, so it's not just quantity, it's also variety. You're seeing the range of thoughts across time, across time. Okay, um, let's see, it's going to be Rupali and then Lloyd. So um, I wanted to add, you know, um, Mortimer Adler uh, did the whole series on grade books. He also started something called the junior grade books um, for younger children. And you can use the same method of inquiry. Um, and the reason I say that for this group is because it's uh, whenever we are looking at art or literature, um, you want to have that inqu inquiry-based um, method of looking at things. You know, what is it? Why is it? How is it? Where did it come from? Wh what was the purpose? What is the artist trying to say? Or the, what are the characters trying to do? So asking yourself questions as you go along um, helps in understanding art and um, kind of, you know, uh, getting the value from what you're reading because clearly the artist has put in some reason and trying to understand that reason. So why does a character behave in a certain manner? Um, the other thing is uh, doing a book club, I think is so much more valuable than just reading it by yourself. I've read this book before and this conversation, the every Saturday meeting is so helpful in 
kind of getting myself to the next level or saying, oh, I never thought about it in this manner or, you know, making connections between books. Um, Maritza, you did a fantastic job of talking about uh, Fountainhead and, um, you know, making that connection for people. So those connections are important in kind of saying, okay, why is this portrayed in the way it is? And I'll just uh, share a story about, uh, you've heard about me talking about children in India doing Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. And so now we are in the point where they are able to say, okay, why is Helena behaving this in this manner? Why is she saying, what is going on in her mind? And so you start understanding the values or the, the uh, emotions of the person or the character and you can apply those things to uh, you know it doesn't matter what culture what place you're from but by asking those uh, questions you can kind of learn about new places you can learn about new things so that's uh, my two cents thank you thank you Rupali uh, Lloyd um I would just say that, you know, one thing that makes uh, something uh, literature difficult is if it's not clear um, uh, that, uh, you know, there is a burden on the author to write clearly. Um, I'm just grateful that we have a panel to explain uh, this particular work, because if you read this without a panel, I don't think you'd be very clear about what's going on. I mean, we take people literally at their word. We don't assume this is shorthand for something else or here's what she meant. She meant something else. You got to write clearly. I mean, if you don't write clearly, your message is going to be lost. And people reading this don't have a panel of people to say, no, that's shorthand. Really what she meant is this or she didn't mean that this is more clear. You got to write clearly. I mean, otherwise, it's really hard. Okay, Lloyd, I mean, I, I disagree. I, mean, I, I found that I found, see, firstly, uh, what shall I say? When somebody's trying to break new ground, so, so it's like I have a very different philosophy of reading. Uh, you know, I take the responsibility for understanding the subject myself. And I'm using the author, and I'm typically reading like multiple people. I've used how to read a book. So I would be reading, for example, Aristotle's Poetics side by side with this. Um, I will be taking concepts from it. And I find that she's clear. Uh, she's, it's not as structured as a, it's not structured as a book. It was written as articles, but I don't think clarity is the issue. Um, I, I, and, and the thing is that I don't know, I mean, I just love it. And I've always found it to be the most powerful of her nonfiction works. So I don't know the, I don't understand the criticism much, um, but I, I think it is just that, you know, it also depends on how much background you have on a field. When you're trying to read, suppose I was reading something on say circuit design, right? If I've done a lot of circuit design, the whatever is being written appears some way to me. If I don't know anything about circuit design, then it is different. So it may be part of the kind of the corpus of background. So I don't know. Uh, does any of the panelists have a co point uh, or uh, any comment on the clarity or presentation of this book? Maritza? Um, I, I mean, I, I've been reading Ayn Rand for years and years and I, I it makes sense to me. Um, I will say that after the first time I read it, I had a million and four. So I'm a, I'm a paper waster. I hate to say it, but I tend to put um, little um, tabs in them. And then, so the first time I read it, I had like a million of them and I went back and everywhere that I didn't understand a concept, I found a book on that. Or every time she mentioned a book, like, so it's because of Ayn Rand that I got into um, Victor Hugo or um, Dostoevsky, you know, I can't say his name, but I have read his works. But in, in her books, she mentions so many different things. And, you know, I'm gonna, I was gonna make a comment about um, the, the questions that um, Joya and Jonathan posed to us, you know, asking about when you have difficulty, what do you do? Or how do you, do you have experience? And, and I'm gonna actually take a step back from Ayn Rand and talk about young adult novels. There is a corollary here. 
So I, I, I got, so I also, when I see a type of a book that is kind of different to me, I can get a little obsessive and read as many different authors in the same genre or subject as I can. And I do it for fiction and nonfiction. And so I, I thought the cost, why people's fascination with vampire type of novels was odd to me. So I just started reading vampire novels. And to my shame, I got hooked, right? So I, I just was like inhaling them all. And then I was so baffled when um, Twilight became this major thing on TV. I was like, all these great novels on vampires and that's the breakout? Because I, I find that the, the author, I, her writing is just terrible. And her characters are underdeveloped and her protagonist is a whine and simpering idiot. So, yeah, sorry. But, but the, the point is, what I did is that I, I found the next trend that in today's popular environment, young adult novels are the ones that are becoming these major movie hits. So I started reading all of these different young adult novels. And I feel like that's kind of my method for how to understand something that I may perceive as difficult concept to understand. I don't know if the book itself is difficult to me, but I, I go and I read, I feel like when I get more data is how I can help to figure out a little bit. So for Ayn Rand, if, if you find her to be unclear, a recommendation I would say is to maybe read some of her other works. And I know that sounds almost counterintuitive because you're like, well, if I find this one to be unclear, maybe I'm gonna find the other one to be unclear. But I mean, Lloyd, if you're suffering through this one and then you switch to We the Living, even though there are really tough things tackled in We the Living as well, you're, it's a whole book. So this is essays and these, some of the topics you've already visited here, and with the living, when you come across them, you might have aha moments. And then you go and you read something else and you come back and read this one again. And I feel like it might seem a little bit clearer to you. And that would just be my suggestions. Um, I want to connect sir, it up. Sir, go ahead. I, I want to come to Lloyd's defense. Oh. Oh, yeah. yeah. Rob, Rob can go. And then I, I want oh, to something to I, I think she was unmuting me. Uh, I just want to come to Lloyd's defense a little bit, which is Ayn Rand has a certain tendency uh, in her writing, especially in this book, to talk to make sort of very broad uh, declarative statements that she doesn't justify. All right, so say like you know, volition has not appeared in literature before the 19th century. Well, what does she mean by that? What examples would be? She doesn't explain it all. She just makes the broad declarative statement. It's it's kind of one of her faults as a nonfiction writer, if you ask me. Um, but. Um, so, because she tends to like make those, you know, base them very strongly without then giving the evidence behind them or explaining exactly what she means. I also think some of the more philosophical parts, especially the first couple of chapters, where she gets to the very philosophical parts, she can write extremely densely. Like, so I can, you, you know, you have to sort of go back and like unpack word by word what she's saying. So it's not in a, it's in a overly dense, almost dry academic style. Uh, there's a lot. There's so much packed in there that, and, and as someone with a lot of experience of and knowledge of the rest of her philosophy, it's easier for me to follow on because I know all the concepts she's referring to. I know how she's treated them elsewhere. And it could be a little opaque if this is your first time. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, it's okay to be, <laughs> to be frustrated that you may, you may well have a case on, you know, her being wrong on a few of the broad declarative statements she makes here. Um, so uh, it, it, I sort of, that's so as, as the panelists, I think we're here to maybe to explain some of the things that come from out of other contexts in her work. And also maybe drawing from our own experience to defend a broad declarative statement that she makes, even if she hasn't given the evidence for it. I think it's like, it's like um, a great work of art that bears um, a lot more fruit, the more you view it, the more you study it. I mean, I think of all of the, all of us on the panel, this is certainly nowhere near the first time that we've read through this book. 
I wanted to say something in line with that, just to share. So the first time I read this book, I had already read all of the fiction, some of the nonfiction, and even some of the biographical materials. So I already had that that huge context before I tackled this. And personally, I think if this were the first book I had picked up, I would find it very hard to understand. And maybe this already even starts to answer our question about how you tackle a, a difficult work of art. Is that you know sometimes you need to sort of go deeper in with that particular artist or, or some of the other contextual things things around it and then that helps illuminate the, the work itself. Okay, I want to add one more thing again connect it up to what uh, the original question Jonathan's question was you know um, how how hard do you have to work in order to appreciate art and I think both these points are connected. Uh, so first point is that firstly you have to determine whether it is worth putting in all the effort okay most in most case of art art is not. Like I, one of my favorite quotes from Seinfeld is, you know, Jerry and George are sitting in this uh, diner and George says, maybe there is more to Newman than we see. And Jerry immediately says, no, there is less. Okay, so there is a lot of art where it just pretends to be something and it is nothing. Okay, and you don't want to waste time on that. So you have to have a reason for saying, look, this is something worth exploring to put in all the effort. Having said that, you have to realize that an artist, whether you know, in fiction or in or non, nonfiction, a writer, a thinker, is actually giving something to you. And the only way you can actually, if it is actually good, okay, and if it is something higher than where you are, you're going to have to work to get it. It's not going to, and it, the more you put in, you're going to get more from it. There are books. I mean, even more extreme example of this is Isabel Patterson, okay, whom Ayn Rand said, Ayn, Ayn Rand's quote was, Isabel Patterson understands politics, I don't, okay? And her writing is much harder, but the insights are incredibly deep. I've not seen anybody who can write, think about politics at that level. But, and once you realize for, for, for me and for, I think for anybody, if you realize that there is something in that book, then you have to learn to break your head to, to do it. You know, you have to have those little sticky notes like Maritza, my method is to write, you know, on the book, you know, underline. And a friend of mine has the concept of destroying a book. Like if you really, if his, his take is that if you really like a book, you have to destroy it. That means you have to take it apart. You have to integrate everything in it, in your head, in your life, so you can throw away the book. Then you have read the book, okay? There aren't that many books that are worth doing that for. I do think that Romantic Manifesto by Ayn Rand is one of those books. And that's, and she, she's opened up a whole world and she is going through and she's showing you all of those things. So any effort that you put on it is uh, richly worthwhile. All right, so we are coming to the end of the uh, meetup. Now, um, what is coming up? What, what's the next one, uh, Joya? Sorry, next we have bootleg romanticism. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's, I don't know if I even want to say more about that or just let that be the teaser for, for oh, no, no, you, about you, what that you, means. You, you can say a couple <laughs> of sentences. Go ahead. So, so in this chapter, we're, we're going to look at the kinds of popular works, mostly fiction, but we're going to look at popular works that are drawing on romanticism, but are not yet at the level of what Ayn Rand would consider the heights of romanticism. And well, I'll just share, I, I think what's really interesting about this is that by seeing these sort of bootleg romantic arts, what does it tell us then about the romantic arts and sort of having them to contrast, I think helps us draw out even what this, this concept is all about. Wonderful. Uh, Jonathan, did we do a decent job of addressing your question? A great job. And I look forward to further conversation. Wonderful.